Yeah, we're having the same kinds of problem here. And Mother Nature is being very mercurial. We were actually caught in a blizzard in whiteout conditions trying to get to town the other day. It was so bad we had to turn around and come home. And now today, it's raining. What? <laughs> I know, I right? Know. It's raining and like you, we are really struggling with the ice. In fact, I may turn just just trying to get down our mountain road. We may just make it an Olympic event because it's like the luge yeah. trying to trying to get down well, there. In fact, my husband's trying to plow and lay some gravel and things. It's a mess. How about just getting to the car? <laughs> it's like ice skating. It That's is. That's where it's for me. I was I was worried about breaking my leg or something. In Jersey, they take care of the roads, and obviously everything is very, you know, uh, metropolis. You know, there's no gravel roads anywhere. So, I mean, people are out there salting and scraping as soon as the snow starts falling. But it's the sidewalks that get me, because you don't even know it's uh, slipping until you step on it and fall on your butt. Well, that's true. We have uh, a lot of black ice out here. Yeah, that's what's bad. And so the road looks, it looks okay. But once you get on it, you realize that it's very slick. So you're right, driving, walking, anything. It's, it's very strange this time of year right now. Well, that kind of fits the, the topic of our conversation, you being in, in the wilderness of Montana, having to fend for yourself. I mean, wintertime is the worst time. Didn't we talk about the women that went out there and pioneered their own land? I mean, they left during the wintertime, didn't they? They went home. <laughs> that's, that's true. Gratefully the requirement was only to spend a few months on the land and so during the winter they were allowed to leave and still retain um ownership of of that homestead act yeah. so true in winter time they left and went went to the nearest town or perhaps went back home and then as soon as the weather turned you know to where they could travel again they went ahead and went back out to the homesteads and stayed in, again in, until the following winter. Do you wish that you were them? <laughs> no, Had a no, whole other honest. home someplace else that you can go to? Oh, uh, in that regard? Yeah. Oh, it does have some appeal, doesn't, doesn't it? it? Where would you go if you it had the does. opportunity to escape the winter in Montana? Well, you know, I used to live in Florida. Oh, uh, yeah. And live there for many years, as, as you know, we've talked about that before. And I really like the beach. Ugh. So <laughs> I, would think, I am not a beach person. I can't stand it. The sharks. That's all I think about. I can't swim in water at all. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I can understand that. See, I really like to walk along the beach. I like to pick up the shells and of course, if you're afraid of sharks, you probably haven't gotten into the water. But, but even if you oh, stand, you know what? And... when I was a kid, I used to swim all the time. Um, remember, uh, you said Pasco County was one of your haunting grounds when you were a, right. uh, a fish and wildlife officer. That's where I grew up, and you know, Green Key Beach was one of my favorite haunting grounds. My mom used to take us there all the time as kids. Anaclo Island, we used to go out there all the time. Mm -hmm. I never thought about sharks. I used to take the canoe out into the middle of the Gulf, you know, and hit coral reefs and stuff. I never thought about it. But now as an adult, I look back on my life then and I'm like, <laughs> I have like a, a PTSD of what could have <laughs> happened. <laughs> well, that's, that's actually kind of funny. And I, now it makes more sense too when you talk to me about being afraid of bears. Why? So that sort of fits, right? What do you mean? How so? Well, the idea of almost having like a post-traumatic type of, of thoughts about it. Um, yeah. So when you look right, at, I mean, you know, it's like the stuff that you, it's like the stuff that can come out of nowhere, right? That uh -huh. can sneak up on you, and all of a sudden you're dead. That's what freaks me out. <laughs> and sharks well, are kind of like that. They just swim out of the murky water and they attack you. Well, they they do. I guess they have to make a living like everybody else, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but not I don't know who I'm that. trying for the the shark fin pirators or the uh, or the sharks themselves. I guess the ecosystem needs them just the same as they need bears. I mean, we don't want deer wandering around all over the place. We want them curbed a little bit, don't we? 
Well, you know, there is a cycle and, and it's true, especially nowadays that if you find the animals begin to overpopulate too much, then you have trouble with diseases and even starvation if there isn't enough food to, mm. to support them. So, um, and I've, I've seen several instances where that's actually happened and they've had to go in and thin them out simply because they were, you know, they were dying horrible deaths. I mean, it was a, a mercy um, as well as, as saving the species. So yeah, that, you know, that's, that's the sad part, but it's kind of a part of the life cycle as well. And they're so delicious though, too. I mean, you don't really want to necessarily leave the fruit on the tree. You don't want them to suffer and you don't want to not go hungry. And plus they're so yummy, might as well enjoy what's out there, the bountiful harvest that's available for you in the wilderness. Well, that's true. You, I mean, we certainly wouldn't even consider the idea of, of, of doing that and then just leaving them. So, so having those kinds of special hunts where they go in, at least those animals are, are used. You're right, it would be horribly wasteful to do anything else. So this time of the year, your husband does not go out and hunt, right? I mean, he, he doesn't like go kill anything now. It's usually in the spring and summertime, right? Am I wrong about that? Well, or is it the, the fall? Yeah, the hunting season is just now ending. So technically he could have gone um, out hunting even yesterday or the day before. But the weather is so bad at this time of the year that generally fall is the best time because mm. you're not trying to trudge through knee deep snow and it isn't it isn't so miserable. It does it does take some of the fun out of it when you're doing that. Yeah, I bet. And, but you're going out for like different types of animals though too, aren't you? Not necessarily deer now, like I don't know, elk or moose or something. <laughs> oh, no. Well, we generally, when he goes, he's not really a big hunter, but he does go with a neighbor who's a friend. And he usually just looks for deer. Elk is, that's a lot of meat and trying to, to process it and pack it down the mountain is, mm -hmm. is very, very daunting and a lot of work. And yeah. that's, that's quite a bit, you know, the deer is certainly more manageable. Yeah, I've heard some uh, 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 accounts of that where they, you know, they have to cart out hundreds of pounds of meat at a time and they're not even done. They have to go back and get more hundreds of pounds of meat and cart it out to the car too. I mean, they're like dozens and dozens of miles away from any kind of civilization for that matter. Well, that's true. They do get out and walk quite a ways and there's some more modern conveniences now, but, but you have to think ahead and have that with you. It's, you know, you'd have to take the truck and the snowmobile or the four wheeler and, you're certainly expecting an outcome when you when you do all of that because you're right you would have to pack it out mm. and it's it's very strenuous work especially in the cold and and if you happen to be in a lot of snow but it's it's nice just to go to and look in fact the other day when they were out bill uh, told me that he saw a moose and he just oh, said like they're dangerous too they are <laughs> 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 and they can attack you of uh, yeah. strange as it sounds and the, what they do is they will rush at you or they will turn around and and kick out at you similar to like what a horse would do uh -huh. and and so they're they can be rather aggressive so yeah i know i've heard this they're they're, they're mean uh, you think they're cute and dopey looking but like they're like vicious <laughs> You don't want to tangle with them and you don't no. want to approach them. Even the one that comes into our yard, we have a female that hangs around here. We call her Lady Moose. And really? I always, she comes up to the she comes up the mountain and hangs out at the house. She does. She's in the driveway wow. all the time. That's how big is she? Do what'd you say? Um, oh she, well she's a female, so she's she's still a sizable, you know, a sizable animal, but she's not as big as the males, but she comes, she like, had you say, 700 and 2,000 pounds, seven feet and um, 7,000 pounds. Let or me so. think about that for a moment. She's probably, oh, she's probably 1,000 pounds. Yeah. Wow. Or more. <laughs> and there she is. And she doesn't want to move. She won't move. And you can't make her do anything. You can't even leave your house for the fear that she'll attack you. You don't well, even know I if know. she's gotten into scrapes with some kind of animal that's given her like rabies or some kind of short temper 
syndrome or whatever. I mean, it's definitely an interesting <laughs> situation you have going on there. No, we definitely get into um, a trend when we talk, don't we? Me, I'm very interested in the wildlife because uh -huh. you can't control it. Um, I think I remember, did I tell you about my friend who lives in Pennsylvania and she walked out and saw like a little 200 pound black bear on her property and she's just standing there taking pictures of it like it's nothing, like it's just a dog or something. <laughs> oh, that, like, is, that is so unwise. Right? And I was like, dude, you know how dangerous the animal is. She's like, it's always oh, it a little black bear. I said, no, it wasn't. That's 200 pounds of fury if it wants to come out to you. You're like 140 pounds. It's horrible to think of the danger that you could be in if one of these animals decided that it didn't want you looking at it. Well, it is. And the one thing you have to remember with anything young, especially the bear, is that mom is always nearby. And the mother bear does not want you looking at her baby bear or taking photos. And so you don't ever want to get around a small one, especially because mother is always near. Yeah. I mean, it makes total sense. I mean, a male bear will kill cubs left and right. So, I mean, they have to be viciously protective over that that genetic offspring. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, it's so fascinating. And then going back to what we were talking about with the weather, too. I mean, all these things could be the perfect storm. Animals, weather, everything is conspiring to keep you locked up on that mountain. And 2018, I mean, it's just crazy. <laughs> you could it, be... it is. And and I have to tell you that sometimes, sometimes Mother Nature wins. Uh, for example, since I was just telling you about the weather, we decided to cancel an event. I was, my poor daughter was disappointed because she has a creative writing group that she's in at the library and they meet once a month. And we took a look at what was happening today and realized that this afternoon it's going to worsen. Oh, no. And so we had to cancel. And unfortunately, that's just the part of life. But you're right. Say we lived in town or just a few miles or so from the library, we probably do that but not when we live this far from town. But I promise I'm going to make it up to her. So. No, oh, man, once a month is terrible. Just it, That would be so painful because now you have to wait 60 to, or, you know, 30 more days to meet with those people. And they've yeah. already, you know, workshopped the story and like, oh, man, that would be so devastating. Yeah, um, she's, she, she's a little disappointed, but she's a real trooper and she takes disappointment well and and I promised to make her spaghetti tonight and we would do dinner and a movie. So we get to watch TV while we're having our meal. So that will help. What is, um, what does she write, your daughter? Yeah, she likes to write some type of fan fiction or she's actually quite creative. She has a series of stories that she calls Mystery Foals. And it's about these, these foals that go out and solve mysteries. And oh, I thought they, it's really cute and she does really well with, with creative and she likes to incorporate a lot of animals in her writings. Gee, where did she get that from? So <laughs> this is your younger daughter or your older daughter? No, this is my youngest and That's she's cool. very, she's very creative. She is 13 and she just loves to write and she's very good at sewing and I've been teaching her about the sewing machine and she loves to draw. She's turning into quite the artist. So it's very interesting to watch them grow and evolve and, right. and see their talents emerge. And the oldest girl, she's 16 ish, right? Nearing the Actually, age that she's going to be deciding things for herself soon. Well, she is. And you know, um, she started college at 16 and oh, tomorrow oh, is her 18th birthday. Oh, wow. And, so how does that and, work? Because, I mean, you go west, young woman, right? And you go from military mm -hmm. wife to, what What do you call yourself? I was going to say hillbilly, but that's wrong. Because <laughs> oh. you're not. <laughs> <laughs> Mount, mountaineer will call you or something along those lines. I mean, but you bring your family out there. You set up shop on a, on a mountain and you do the right. homeschooling thing. And now uh -huh. this, this young woman is 18, right? And she's gone west with you. Does she stay west or does she look for what you had at 18, 19, 20 years old, a chance to explore the world. I mean, as a, as, a, as a parent, it's like, I get freaked out with my kids going in the kitchen. 
Then <laughs> 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 they're only like, they're going to be three in April. So I'm like, no, don't go in the kitchen. There's so many dangers here. And I just realized the other day that I'm like prohibiting them from exploring the surroundings because I'm so concerned with their, their safety and, and whatnot. How does it feel to have an 18 year old who's been on the mountain most of her life, adult life, you know, mm-hmm. growing up, whatever years and now she's going to have the opportunity to flee that and go someplace else well this is how i feel about it all this time i've been preparing her to become independent and one of the reasons i had her start school so early was being homeschooled she really excelled and a lot of the colleges wouldn't let her in until she was 18 and I really didn't want her just sitting around for a couple of years waiting for that. So I went to our college here. Uh, They have a local satellite and they're part of the University of Montana system. And I talked to the director and he said, well, I'll tell you what, if she can pass the entrance exams, we'll go ahead and let her in. Okay. So I I said, great. So she went ahead and did the exams and I this is a one of those no brag, just fact situations. She passed everything with a 97 and a 98 and tested all the way through calculus. Good for her. So they said, of course, she can she can come in. Well, she's a dean's list straight A student. And in, oh, about one more term, she's going to graduate. Well, now she's 18 and she'll already have a two-year college degree. So she's at the point in her life where she needs to decide, do I want to go on to school? Do I want to try to work? And the world is really opening up for her. But all along in these baby steps, I guess, even as well as starting college so early, she had to get in there and compete and and get along with and learn how to manage her life in and among adults in a college situation. So every step prepares her to be more independent. And I'm, I'm pretty confident that whatever she decides to try with all of this experience under her belt at a younger age, that, that she'll do well. And of course, you know, mom and dad, we're always going to be here to, to help out and encourage. And so she won't be alone, but it'll be a very exciting time. I mean, she still lives with you guys. She's not like in a dorm or anything like that. No, she's, she's at home. Right. Uh, she's too young to go live in a dorm. I wasn't going to put her in a dorm at 16. No. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, so what What kind of um, – so you're always in town then. You're constantly back and forth off the mountain. You, you're able to do that on a daily basis and get her to school and and stuff like that. Yes. We have had a mix of online courses, which we tended to do more in the in the winter, and then what they call the hybrid classes – where some of it's online and some of it is is in the classroom. And I then in the, I did not right. fare very well with the online courses. I, I took it as an opportunity to basically be as lazy as humanly possible. <laughs> <laughs> I impressed my professors more with the with my oral abilities, you know, be talking in class and participating. That's where my grade would come from. Not tests. I am not a test taker at all. Well, tests are hard for a lot of people, that's true. And and she really, she enjoyed being in the classroom during the summer. She was in class every day. And we'll be doing that again on this on this summer term. So it's really a nice mix. It didn't completely just overwhelm her and throw her into this situation all at once. And so I think it worked out really well doing some online and some in the in the classroom. So, I mean, you're writing a sequel to your first novel now i am i am in fact i have some great news about it um i have recently heard from the publisher and we are going to be moving forward with the second book i don't have a release date yet but we so it's ready it's done it's done and we've started started working on it did i lose you no i'm here Oh, okay. Got really quiet there for a second. <laughs> no, congratulations. You were, gone. <laughs> we're both staring. Who's going to say something first? <laughs> um, congratulations. That's wonderful. Are you working out? Are you jumping into the third one now? Or are you just preparing for the second one's launch and getting your marketing to a plan in place and all that good stuff? I'm actually doing both. I did start writing a third book. I'm in about the second chapter of it. 
And then of course, once we really get rolling with the production on the, on the second book, which is the sequel to Go West Young Woman, uh, I, I just wanted to get a head start on everything. So I'm continually yeah. working every day That's and I'm good. also doing all the videos. Oh yeah, I saw those, it was wonderful. Um, so the second book, the first book was written while you were moving to Montana. And the second book I would imagine is about your experiences there, right? Or I mean, you were a newbie going into it and now you're a little bit more experienced with the second memoir. Exactly, the, the first book basically focused on our huge, huge learning curve and culture shock yeah. of trying to figure out how to leave the city and live live in a really rural environment with with all of this wildlife because I talk about the cougars and the bears and the wolves and the coyotes and the moose, our lady moose, and we even had a, a male come into the yard one time. So so living with this wildlife is is really on a daily basis. And it, it's it's a very interesting life. And so you have to learn how to adapt to all of that. The second book, which I believe we're going to call Stay West, Young Woman, uh -huh. because I, I will tell you a lot of people that come out and live a life like this, after a year or two, they just give up and go home. I so, mean, modern conveniences aside, it's definitely hard, even though, I mean, when night it hits, it's night. <laughs> and there's no walking out to the street. There's no taking a walk. I mean, you want to stay away from the outside during the nighttime for humans and not horses and dogs and all that good stuff. It's dangerous out there. That's very true. That's There's very a lot true. of hidden things that you don't think about. I mean, do you cover in the second book your family struggles with it too? Or is it is it more just your individual insights into No, I always I always include the family and different stories about them as individuals and how they're dealing with things as well as my own thoughts and feelings because we're a you know we're a unit and we work together and we rely on each other and that's very important in a lifestyle like this but we also have our own needs and feelings and joys and thoughts and fears and we we talk about those too and of course there's always a big dose of humor in the book it's it's very similar to the first book in that way because I tend to look at everything with a sense of humor and you, you have to in life. Yeah, oh, totally. If you go through life with a, you know, a bad attitude, it's going to slap you right across the face. I mean, you're never going to feel any kind of joy if you have a, as if you have a bad attitude about things. Um, I was curious because I see, you know, we um, do the graphic for this show every time we talk. And I think this is our third time, right? No. It is our third time. And I'm right. really, I'm really enjoying I, it. Yeah. Yeah, we'll do it again. I really enjoy talking to you, but I notice in every single picture that you send me, you always wear a cross on your neck. Do you, I do. Do you to speak of your, your experiences with your religion in such a rural environment? Well, you know, that's interesting because people have asked me before about what religion I am, and I honestly am not really a particular religion. You know, I'm not Methodist. You're not a Catholic or, or a Baptist or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So I can't really say that I fit into any category, but I do have my my faith. And I think that that does play a big part in my life of how I move forward, how I make my decisions, and just how I look at life in general. And And I find it very, very helpful to me basically to just live by a certain, you know, a certain code of ethics. And, and that does come from my faith. And what about your family? Do they, I mean, I would just, I just, I don't know. I see the cross on your neck in every single one of those pictures. And I just mm -hmm. imagine it's hard to go to church every Sunday per period, but I mean, based on what you just said, you're probably not going to church anyway. You're carrying that kind of you're right. idea uh -huh. of religiosity into your family. Right. I don't, like I said, I don't uh, have a specific faith. There really isn't isn't any churches around here per se, you know, that we could go to and then trying to go to one in a different town is, is not particularly realistic. And I'm not real concerned about, uh, you know, about the girls being in church. I'm more concerned about their relationship, you know, with God. And if they have, have something that, 
like I said, a, a code, you know, a, a type of thought and behavior value system per se that they live by. So that's that's more Very of what I, I found. I talk to a lot of parents about that code, that value system, how it kind mm -hmm. of comes hand in hand with a, a religious ideology or whatnot. And you know, my kids aren't going to be probably raised in a church environment. You know, me and my wife are very skeptical on all that stuff. So, I mean, that's probably going to stop with us. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we're both about the Catholic churches as, as younger people, but not any longer. Um, so, I mean, it's very fascinating that you're kind of bringing that to your children in a very, you know, non-organized manner. Does that show up in the in the book, in either book? Um, I, I don't really think so. I don't. I don't think I touch much on that or, or talk about that. I'm certainly willing to if somebody asks me, but for the most part, I think I've always been relatively private about my faith. Um, mm. You know, if someone asks me about it, I will explain it to them or what I think and feel, but that's, that's just me. I've, you know, I'm not really one to go out and kind of recruit people in, into <laughs> their faith or into their relationships. It's, Nancy it's, Quinn religion. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm really, I guess I'm more private about that in that respect. But I I really feel that it's important for the girls to to have a value system. I'm going to pass that along to them. There are certain things, you know, I, our whole country is based on a Judeo-Christian value system. Yeah. I mean, even on the dollar bill, it says, you know, in God we trust. And so there are just certain values I think that. For example, the Ten Commandments that are very basic that I think they should know about and understand and live by. Um, how you're supposed to treat people, what you're supposed to expect from other people, um, what you don't accept as far as being treated. You know, this is wrong. You shouldn't shouldn't accept this idea. I also teach them logic in school. I think it's very important that they have an analytical way of looking at things so that they're not put into peer pressure or talked into something they don't want to do. They need to be very secure in who they are if they're going to navigate the world. I would say, you know, being very secure in their ability to think and question and reason, right? I mean, not just accepting something because it's dogma is very important. And I love that idea of logic. Um, yeah, I just I read the other day that in God we trust thing that we're, we're so used to seeing that was created in the 1950s to counter the godlessness of the communists and how they didn't have a God, but we did or something along those lines. It's not like necessarily American going back to the beginning of the revolutionary war. It's right. It's just art. And the entire system is very fascinating. And in terms of the way that your religion, uh, you're what you're living within your religion. It's very pioneer esque because honestly, I mean, if you go out to the middle of Kansas, there are no churches. You know, you'd bring your Bible and you're kind of living like that by your own moral yes, compass. Yes, I, I see what you say. That's that's an interesting analogy because because you're right. It's yeah, I think it's more focused, like you said, on on the value system rather than rather than something that's uh, organized. So I'm not even sure. I think it's Buddha who said, you know, live do unto others as you'll you want them to do unto you. And I mean, if you're living on a mountain someplace, you definitely want to be kind to your neighbors because <laughs> you're not calling the cops to get them to, you know, stop beating on you or whatever it is. So, I mean, you want to be very nice to those people and they're going to be very nice to you because it's kind of like, what is it, a Wild West type of mentality of be nice to well, you, be nice to you back. That's true. That's that's a very interesting way of looking at it. And and it has a lot of merit. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, moral moral compasses are very important, and religion does provide you with kind of a basis in that. Um, and then I was thinking on my way home, walking the dog the other day, that you know, your husband being prior military, probably a combat vet too, when he retired. Um, yeah, you'd have to have some idea. I mean, what do they say? There are no atheists in foxholes. <laughs> That's a very common common term, and you're right. I've heard that many times. And, and you being, you know, the military wife, I mean, you're you're basically a combat vet too if he goes overseas. Well, we we have had situations where he was actually sent on missions for months at a time where I was allowed no contact because what he was doing was very secret, and so I didn't know where he was or had any type of letter or phone call or anything, and. That's that's a tough time. Um, you just have to wait and have faith that everything will will be okay. And 
And even at his work, uh, when he worked at the Pentagon, you know, I think I mentioned to you that he survived the September 11th attack. Oh, man, I know, right? Death at his foot, uh, feet, basically. It, uh, it, was, it was all right there. And so you, like, once again, I was helpless. There was really nothing I could do but, but wait and wonder and try to hope for the very, very best. And I have to tell you, there were a few times where the doorbell would ring at a late hour and I could hardly catch my breath because my first thought would be, they're sending someone to notify me. And, yeah. you know, so, yeah, so you would have to just steal yourself up and take a step forward. And, and of course, I was grateful to find out it was nothing like that. But those kinds of thoughts are always in the back of your mind. And it's just part of part of the lifestyle. Yeah, doorbells to me are like sharks and bear. I don't like them. So I've disconnected ours. <laughs> 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 and it's very interesting 9-11 was basically i was in the military before 9-11 which was a different animal and then afterward i imagine that it became a totally different beast churning and spitting out body parts left and right i mean that that's got to be an odd situation to be a part of do you write about that experience in in your novel in your memoirs about being a military wife about you know obviously they're about you but you know, that's such a unique experience that you don't really get to read a lot about. It is. And I did I did discuss a little bit of it in the first book, uh, which was Go West, Young Woman. We, we talked about that. But it's not really the focus of that book. But I mm. did set it up and explain it as a premise and in a way that you can understand why we decided to make the lifestyle change that we did. Mm-hmm. So yes, I did discuss it a little bit in there. So the, um, the second book is Staying West, Young Woman, or you sticking mm-hmm. with, uh, okay. Yeah, we decided, um, I think we're going to go with Stay West, Young Woman. And basically, stay West, it's young woman. the, you know, the, the, the Montana homesteading adventure continues idea. Yeah. And even though we're a little more savvy right now, we are still encountering things that are definitely worthy of telling the story and so there's still a lot of excitement in in the second book what kind of narrative style do you kind of undertake with telling the story itself are you writing in first person are you bouncing back and forth between your present life and thinking about your past or how are you telling the story well i do like to tell things basically from my point of view so most of all the stories are discussed with the idea of of looking at it from my perspective and and my perception. And I find that it's in it's easier for me to write about it in in that way because I'm basically recalling my memories and I always again tend to have a humorous slant on things. And so it just makes more sense to pull the stories together that way. And that way I can build them and I can draw you right in and make you feel like you're there with me and seeing and hearing and experiencing what I am. So that's the way I like to do it. I mean, I would imagine, I the only reason I bring up your daughters is I'm incredibly interested in the type of life they're living, you know, up on a Mm -hmm. mountain, being homeschooled, in this wilderness land where, you know, they're forced, their chores are very important because lives are at stake if they don't participate and do what they're supposed to do. You know, if they cheat, a horse dies or they cheat, the chickens die. Or do you have chickens? You don't have chickens. I don't have chickens because they are just a magnet for predators. And I have enough trouble keeping cougars and, and wolves and things out of the yard. And so I really don't need the chicken saying, hi, the buffet is open. Uh, yeah, so, right figure out a way to have yeah, chickens I, that'd be the best thing about having like a big piece of property is those eggs but no I'm, I'm curious though because i mean if you look at the narration that you're basically weaving within that mm-hmm. is your husband and your children and even your horses for him for that matter i mean you're really your way of life has you know great impact on these people's existence and i wonder if you tell the story of your children's experiences being moved west as well oh definitely. when you say young woman definitely. i don't think just of you i think of them as well 
You're right. And because the story is definitely about the family. And I do have individual stories, even about the girls and their experiences. And you're right. Is that where, um, is that where the conflict comes from? I mean, obviously you love it because that was your choice to move out there. Mm -hmm. But the conflict for them is that you love it and you move them out there. They had no choice in the matter. That to me is compelling. I mean, God, that's such amazing conflict. Well, that's true. When, when we moved here, they were three and they were seven. So you're right. They didn't have a, a, a vote. And, but I think as with any kids that are growing up, again, there's always that, that give and take and the good and the bad. Uh, yeah. Do they sometimes complain about having to go out in below zero weather and feed the horses? Absolutely. <sighs> yes. I, I complain too. So so there are some things that aren't great about it. However, you're correct. They're they're mature enough to have the understanding that in the winter, if I don't go and feed the horses, then something terrible will happen. And yeah. they're living I mean, in, in my in mind, park. though, I had to mow the lawn every single weekend when I was a kid. You know, this is Florida, <laughs> so there was no stopping in the wintertime. The lawn always grew. But looking back on it, I love the smell of freshly mowed grass. I love the idea of mowing a lawn, too. So to me, it's not them. It's not a sad story. They have to go out there and feed the horses in zero degree weather. It's making them stronger people. But in the moment they have to do it, there's the complaint. You know oh, what I mean? Oh, sure. But, but they also, they love their horses. And Wilson and Whiskey are very much a part of the family. Mm -hmm. And so they, it, it, it's a labor of love in that regard because they, they, you know, they want them to be cared for. And, and we check on them twice a day and we make sure that they're all right and and getting everything that they need and they're not showing any signs of of you know getting ill or or a problem with their foot or something that's wrong so they're they're looked after like like any member of the family what do you think their lives would like if you hadn't moved to montana if you had you and your husband were sitting down you know discussing what are we going to do now that you retired and you decided to move to florida instead do you think they'd be the same people do you think you would be the same person or do you think oh. Oh no, yeah, definitely not. We, I, I do believe that you are a product of your environment, and what you choose to do with that, of course, is is individual. And so, so yes, I believe that they probably would be different people simply because their the environment that they were raised in was so different. Do you ever regret moving them out there? No. I do question. Do you, do you ever regret moving out though? <laughs> no, I I don't. Um, now, if you know, I'm not going to just say, "Oh, it's absolutely wonderful every day," and and I I don't regret it. But if you're asking me if there's times when I question it, of of course there is. Um, I think that's what, basically what pops the question in your head. What's making that appear? What do you question about the decision? Because I mean. Montana doesn't want outsiders, right? As far as what I've read, they do not want people moving there because that feels like it changes their culture, right? Have I heard that right? Yeah, I think that I think that there are people that feel that way. I I agree with you. Um, like there's rich people that come up to Billings or and have their little gated communities and move away again. So there's like a constant influx of money that goes away. It's like a wave of poverty. Well, there's all there's also. We have a lot of people that just come in for, you know, they're seasonal. Yeah. That's I know what I mean. when, when we moved here, several people asked us, you know, are you seasonal? And, and I said, no, we're, we're here for the long run. You know, we're here for the long term. And some people were, were glad to hear that. And other people sort of gave me that, well, we'll see look on their face. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, that, will you be tough enough to, you know, to stick it out? Um, so that was that was kind of interesting, but in the in the larger cities, you're right, Billings and Bozeman, they have have quite an influx of people from from all over, and they're more of a cosmopolitan type of of situation. And of course, Missoula is a college uh, college town, so they have their own type of culture there as well. So it's interesting because everywhere you go, it's just a little bit different. It's fascinating that, you know, it is hard <laughs> to think of mm -hmm. moving up there and doing what you did. I mean, moving from, you know, New York City to, you know, Jersey was hard. And we have the same exact amenities, you know, <laughs> cement <laughs> and streetlights and no bear and no cougars or whatever. But you went from 
I don't know, where did you move from again? Was it Washington, D.C.? It was because uh, yeah. the last assignment my husband had was the Pentagon. So we left D.C. and came up here. So you were living in urban blight, basically. <laughs> Cement everywhere. Yes. You know, you had your cherry trees. Everything was manu, um, you know, what do you call it? Is, uh, everything is kind of shaped and made perfect for human consumption. And then you move from there to the wilderness with all your boxes and all your stuff. And there's no 7-Eleven. I mean, that's just in a truly, I mean, that is hard. Well, it, well, it is. And, you know, over time, we've kind of acquired some, some do's and don'ts of, of living in the West. And it, so, you know, it, it's kind of funny. For, for example, you, I have one of the jokes that, that I have, I happen to need prescription glasses for distance. Ooh. And uh -huh. so I know now that you don't, don't leave home and wander around without your prescription glasses because if you're looking in the distance that that elk that you think is a moose uh, might be a grizzly bear and you know so you have to be very aware of what's Nancy, around you and what you're seeing what is wrong with you and my wife i don't understand be, both of you put your glasses on your face and leave them there <laughs> well, because you, you and her probably would be no. best friend. No, I'm sorry. I wear my. I cannot wear my. I cannot not wear my glasses. They're always on my face for that exact same reason. I don't know where the the, the you know the conflict is going to come from. I need to know if that's an elk or a bear. I need to know. I'm not even going to guess. <laughs> yeah, but if I have my distance glasses on all the time, oh, I I can't, can't see, see anything close up. up close, and oh. and you can't really you know, wander around when you're doing that because it's it's definitely focused for distance. I basically use them for driving. Well, I but, mean, so, I mean, if you really look at it, that's a disability. I mean, you moved up there with a hindering aspect to your life as well. You can make things yeah, yeah, you have to, You have to really be paying attention. And, yeah. and so I carry them with me uh, because I don't want to get too close to something and realize, oh, dear, it's, it's, you know, I've got a few stories about that. A couple of them, they're, they're dangerous, but right. they really illustrate the idea of situational awareness. And Situational awareness is a great mm -hmm. term for it. And, and, and you just have to make sure you're not underestimating anything that's around you. And that includes the weather, like we talked about earlier. You know, you really have to be paying attention to the weather. Um, and, oh, and... And one of the other things you really do have to understand when you go somewhere is that the traffic jams here are usually caused by things with four legs and not four wheels. That's interesting. And so sometimes you'll be planning to go to town and there's a cattle drive. So you're delayed because there's a few hundred cows that are trying to, the cowboys are trying to keep them on the side of the road, but they wander, you know, of course, onto the highway. And so you have to wait until the cows are collected and pushed over to the side before you can begin to drive by again. It's and and that's happened to us a few times. They still have, have the modern cattle drives, but they're not out in the middle of the nowhere. They're down the highway. That's fascinating. I think I told you my mom moved to Ohio. And she lives on somebody else's farmland. But um, one day I was at her place and I woke up, looked out the window and there's this giant cow head just staring at me. <laughs> <laughs> Standing in her garden. I, I actually shoot it away. So I've been on a cattle drive before. It's kind of it had one cow in it, but it was it was an interesting experience. <laughs> Your one cow cattle drive. <laughs> My one cow cattle drive, exactly. You know what I wanted to ask though? I mean, you and your husband, if you hadn't been so motivated together, it would make it hard. I mean, if one of you said, I don't want to move to Montana, and the other one said, well, you're moving to Montana because I spent 30 years in the military or whatever, and you got there and you hated it, he would eventually hate it too, and you moved out. But do you feel like you both loved it to the point where there was no other way or excuse, and you were dedicated and motivated to stay there? Yes, I, I can tell you that my marriage we have a really good relationship as far as looking at things like a partnership. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of, well, you're moving to Montana and here we go, it, it wouldn't have happened. Um, when he first floated the idea about moving to Montana, I had never been out West. So I didn't really have an opinion. And he said, well, will you be willing to just go out there and take a look around? And I said, of course. So we did something really fun and we, we flew out to, let's see, it was Colorado, 
and we rented a big van and we wandered around the West for an entire month. And we just went to all these states and all these towns and just took a look at what was out here and if we felt there was a place that we could call home. So once I came out here, I really fell in love with the West, with the mountains and the way of life and just the whole culture in itself. So I told him, I said, I'm, I'm willing to do this. I, I think it'd be a good idea. I think it would be good for our family. And then we took a second trip and began to really focus on some areas that we wanted to look at. So, but if I had told him, you know, I've come out here, I've looked it over, it's really not right for me. I know that he would have abandoned the idea and we would have tried to find another place that we could both agree on. Does that what were the other places? On? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Because yeah. I mean, you put a lot of thought into it and I've been out west. I mean, I've been to Denver, I've been through Colorado and Nevada and Utah and up through California and Idaho. Never been to Montana and, you know, the western portion of Washington state. I lived in Seattle for a little bit. So, I mean, it's a totally different world. I mean, you go out there and you think, okay, well, here's Denver, but around Denver, there's nothing. Or where there's, you know, the two other cities, but around the, that metropolitan area, there's nothing. I mean, it's basically, it takes you hours to get to the next town. The map You're is right. kind of... And, and that's one of the other things that was pretty funny I had to get used to out here was that the idea when someone told me oh, don't worry, you can go to such and such town. It, it's not far. It's all hours not away. Far, <laughs> not far to a Montanan is several hundred miles. Okay? Yeah, I know, That's right? not far. And I mean, this is also can... a place where people, they get into an accident during the wintertime, they end up on the side of the road. You could t potentially get buried by snow and be left there for weeks or months. I mean, that happens to people all the time. But I mean, uh, where were the other places where you were considering going besides Montana? Well, we did look at we did look at the Colorado area. I really liked Colorado, but it's very hard to find um, larger tracts of land there. And so yeah, it's, it's very moved into. Right. It's it's usually like five acres or ten acres or something. Um, some of the other states that we looked at, we just simply couldn't afford. The land was was so expensive. And, and that's happening again more and more in, in parts of the West. So, uh, but the states we looked at, we looked at Washington State and Oregon, and we looked at Idaho, uh, of course, Montana, Colorado. So we, we wandered all around investigating a lot of those, those areas. But Helena was a nice little town and it's very clean and it's very family oriented and was, had a lot of good things going for it. And considering that I was looking at a really good place, where can my kids grow up? Because I don't want the girls to be isolated and mm. they're not isolated. You know, they, they have friends and they belong to groups and things. And we have their friends come out for pizza parties and birthdays and barbecues and sleepovers and stuff. So they have a, a pretty active social life. And I was even looking at that. Point one thing out. Pizza yeah. parties aren't Pizza Hut parties. They're you're making the pizza. No, they're homemade. Yes, yeah, you're right. Exactly. <laughs> I just just want to clarify that because I mean, you say pizza party, and some people might think that you know, oh, Papa John's awesome, but no, you're actually making everything there because nobody's going to be delivering up to the mountain. You're correct. Yeah, we don't get any food deliveries up here, <laughs> and and gratefully we have a a very brave uh, UPS guy that he'll he'll bring that truck up here. We keep everything plowed as much as possible during the winter, but he'll come up and sometimes he'll say, Nancy, you need to tell Bill that it's time to plow because there's some drifts I had to get through. <laughs> so so the, do they drive like a regular UPS truck or do they have a special rural Montana truck? They usually have a more rural version of it. It, it looks like a pickup truck with a big um, cab style thing on the back of it. It's in the summer, they often drive the great big ones that you're used to seeing come to your door. But mm -hmm. you're right, seasonally, they have a more of a uh, four-wheel drive pickup style of truck that they drive up here. What amazed me about Ohio, you know, obviously being from Florida, that's where I got my college degree from. That's where I joined the army from. You know, everything is really cement and there's very little snow. Up in the Appalachians, they even drive like the big four-by-four four trucks just to deliver regular mail. 
so they can continue mm -hmm. on. That was surprising for me too. And that's there. <laughs> Imagine what it's yeah. like in Montana. I mean, Wyoming would be another place I would think of as like a little bit more rural though, isn't it? A little bit more, there's nobody did, living in Wyoming. We did consider Wyoming and, but it was, I think it was a little more, my, Wyoming is, I think is more isolated. It's a lot yeah. more spread out. And so- There's nobody living I, there. I mean, it's got a very, very small population. Yeah, I, we looked at that and thought, well, you know, maybe, maybe not really for the whole family, you know, the whole family, uh, experience and so we decided that that where we are here in montana was probably our best our best choice and, and alaska too would be neat but obviously that is very isolated potentially it is we actually thought about alaska we didn't go there but we did talk about the idea uh because bill's father had lived there for a while but Again, part of the problem there is mail order business. Can you imagine how expensive and how difficult that would be? And yeah. a lot of my work is mail order. I, I send out some of the art and the books and such. So that would be that would be very detrimental to to running in a business at home. So we decided not to do that. Oh, that's interesting. So that opens up the next line of questioning that I wanted to get into with you. So you have another book coming out. It's been okayed by the publisher. And I see that you're working on marketing. I love your videos that you're putting out right now. I think that's a really great um, thing. I really like it a lot. Um, did you happen to see the last one? I did answer your question about the bear. What was my question about the bear? I did watch it. I think I watched it. <laughs> it well, it's only been up a couple of days. You may not have seen it. But um, yeah, you should you should, you should, should see that one. <laughs> is, there, is there a bear in the video? Uh huh. <laughs> oh no, I gotta watch it then. Did you even send me a link for it? I don't know if I even got a link. I I thought I did because I I did answer your question in there, okay. and it, it's a little. What it is is it's a new segment I just started, and it's called High Noon Tea. Okay, and I saw High Noon Tea. I might not have clicked on it. I might have gotten distracted. Yeah, well, I I answer questions that people send in to me, and I also recommend some of my favorite teas during the. Um, the little segment. They're just a couple of minutes a piece. They're very short, but I thought it was a wonderful way to be able to answer people's questions and, and talk to them um, yeah, almost one-on-one -on -one because it's a very casual type of setting. And mm -hmm. I've only uh, put two of them out. I have recorded two or three more that are waiting in the wings, but it, it's pretty fun and I'm starting to enjoy it. So you'll have to see the last one. Because I definitely will check it out. Yeah. I love this marketing. I love this that, I mean, you're doing this YouTube thing, so you understand what I mean. It's like everyone that you do develops new ideas for future ones. So you're constantly like developing these new ways to interact with your creativity that I find really amazing. Even with these podcasts that I get to talk to people, everyone is a little bit different and you enhance the next one by having, you know, the present one that you're doing. It's really great. You I mean, what's your plan? Well, yeah. they do sort of build on each other, and you're yeah. right. It does spark new ideas and new avenues. Um, with now, gratefully, with YouTube being so visual, it's wonderful for me because I can share everything that we have here with the mountain scenery and the, you know, the, the beautiful ice trees in the winter. And and then I even had a one called "Are You Smarter Than a Snowstorm?" and it it featured how we how we deal with the snowstorms that that mother nature dishes out to us up here. And so I can look at all aspects of life, even the baking ones and um, now this high noon tea segment. So it's wonderful. And once the weather gets better, I'm really looking forward to getting back outside and doing more things with the horses. And and that way you can really involve people and let them let them see for themselves what what kind of an experience it is it's it's very exciting yeah i love it i really do i'd like to see you get into more of the history of montana too because i don't think that's a state that people know a lot about but a lot of interesting things have happened there i did I, I did people. focus on some historical aspects in the first book and i do have more history in the second book that's coming out so you should enjoy that part excellent i love history so much i, do I mean too. we definitely can't have what we have now without what was already um man what else do we have what's going to happen with the new novel when it actually gets published do you have any plans in place for for that well i will be doing some more of 
the little book tours with Barnes and Noble. So I'm looking forward to to doing that. Oh, great. And, Good for you. Uh, where where do you where did you go for the last tour? Well, I did let's see, I was in Missoula. Missoula and okay. in you fact, went to the college. <laughs> I, I well, I actually went to the Missoula Barnes and Noble there. And you know, there's kind of a, a cute story with that because it was it last year, of course, was the very first book signing that I did with Barnes and Noble and it happened to be in Missoula. So about a week before I was in Missoula getting things set up and talking to them and we wandered around looking at the thrift stores because my kids love it and I do too. It's it's a very fun activity. And I came across this this really pretty jacket. And ah, it's, the jacket. it's in the, it's in the photo I sent you if if you uh, want that's to. That's a cool them. cool jacket. It's like a cowgirl jacket with a whole bunch of fringe on it. It was really neat. You found that in a thrift store? Yes, and it has such an interesting history itself. My husband found it and he said, "What do you think of this?" And I said, "Well, it's really pretty. It's really interesting looking, but I don't know I don't know where or how I would I would wear it." <laughs> and he said, "Well, why don't you just try it on and see how it well, I tried it on it fit me perfectly." And the man that uh, owned the store came up to me and he said, oh, I'm so glad that you're looking at this jacket. He said, there's a really fascinating thing. And I said, what's that? And he said, well, it was actually belonged to one of the rodeo queens. And I thought, oh, that makes sense because it's, it's not really a costume per se, but it is a dramatic and rather stunning jacket. And it's mm -hmm. very tailored and fitted and I could, that made sense to me. And he said, yeah, he said she finally couldn't wear it anymore and decided to go ahead and, and uh, put it up here on, you know, consignment with my store. But uh, so I thought, you know, this would be perfect for my first book signing with Barnes and Noble. So I bought the jacket and that photo I sent you was, was from Missoula when I had my first signing there. So it always has a very special meaning for me. And I just, I just loved it. So it, it went well. And then they, they asked me to come. I went to Great Falls and uh, I went to Bozeman. Great Falls, Minnesota? Um, no, Great Falls in Montana. Oh, okay. And, and then I was in, I was in Bozeman. Now this year, I'm hoping to go over to Spokane in Washington state. Okay. Um, I've been invited to Florida. I don't quite know logistically how that's going to work out as far as getting over there but that's uh that's certainly a possibility in the future but it's kind of hard to travel right now too far away when i have you know the family and the horses and everything but we'll see that that's yeah, a real that's possibility so i may end up in, in florida and some other places so how did one of these uh book signings work for you do you sit at a table and sign books or do you actually lecture a little bit about your experiences in the West? Or how, how do you handle the whole experience itself? Well, the ones with Barnes and Noble, which is, you're familiar with the bookstore chain, mm -hmm. uh, they, they set up a nice table for me. And I basically just chat and talk with everybody that, that comes in. So I don't necessarily do a formal presentation. Um, you, I've done those with public libraries and things like that. But usually the bookstores are just you, you advertise that you're coming in and then people come to talk to you. You also get people that are just coming in and out of the store for their own reasons. So it's, it's really nice. I love all that contact and getting a chance to, to hear what people are, are thinking and asking and because they always have interesting questions. So I enjoy that. I enjoy the book signings. I imagine you would. I mean, getting there, getting in and interacting with people that have read your work has got to be, that kind of feels so good. It does, but it's also fun to introduce it to people who who haven't uh, read the book or they're they're unaware of what I'm doing and what I'm writing about, and How do you and find that's kind people? of fun. Well, they usually just walk in, and I'm there. They always set you up in the front, and uh -huh. so I introduce myself and I tell them I'm here signing my book, and if they're interested, you know, if they'd like to take a look at one. It's a very low pressure situation. I I don't want to, you know, feel like, well, she's harassing me to read my book or something. So <laughs> I, I I usually just suggest it and 
I have a copy in my hand and if they want to look at it, that's fine. And if they don't, that's fine. Uh, some people just see you and immediately come right up to you. So. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. That would be yeah. the last thing in the world I would do. If I saw somebody there smiling at me, like, oh, running away. <laughs> what is she trying to sell me? Nope, 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 well, nope, nope, nope. <laughs> I'll be honest. Some people, some people do that. Um, yeah. If you're going to get out in the public, you're going to have to to not get your feelings hurt, you know, very easily. You yeah, kind of have to true. have a thick skin because there are um, people who just look at you and, and turn away. Yeah. They'll be mean to you. I it comes, uh, What brings it to mind uh, for me is, um, you know, comedy stores, they make you bark on the, the street corners to get people to come in. And the more people you get to come in to see the comedy show means that you can go up and do your five minutes or whatever. Really? And, um, I've never heard of that. Yeah, <laughs> they just basically stand on the, the street corners of New York. And for a very, very short amount of time, I worked for the Maury Povich show. And did I did you? that oh, same thing as an audience coordinator. I would go out on 34th Street and ask people if they wanted to sit in our audience. I found it kind of enjoyable. Once you get into it, you know, if you're not afraid, you know, basically break through that anxiety. It's funny how you can interact with people. They're, and some of them are incredibly mean. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this is this is New York. So I mean, I mean, who sets that up for you? Is it your publisher or do you set them up yourself? Uh well both actually. Uh we, we kind of work as a team and but I usually do all the coordinating because I like to set my own schedule. Mm. And I, you know, I'm the one that has to do all the traveling. So I usually set up a, a time and a day that's convenient for me and and then I try to to sort of string them together. Mm -hmm. um and and set my own time so as a rule i have you know i have the final the the, the final say on on my schedule but it's, do you send them posters and things to put up or do you send them books or they already they buy the books beforehand they they do all of that they uh create the poster for you in fact i'm i'm getting quite a nice little collection of my posters because when i'm done i always ask them before i leave do you mind if i keep the poster and of course they don't because they, you know, they another one gets, gets put on top of it, yeah, or <laughs> exactly. in time it probably ends up in the trash or something, but they're always very gracious and they take the posters down and, and give them to me. So I, I have a nice little collection for my, my uh, well, not really scrapbook because they're too big to fit in one, but, you know, just for my own use. And uh, so they, they help you advertise and they, they have all of that set up for you. The books are purchased already ahead of time. And so when I come in, they generally set up a nice little table with the books. I, I have a few little things that I bring on my own because I have uh, free book bags that I give away if you buy a book from me and some bookmarks and little, little goodies and things. And, and so I set those up on the table as well. And then we're ready, we're ready to go. That's so fascinating. Uh, I get to see kind of the aftermath of putting you on my show. People love you. People really, oh. <laughs> really like your personality. Oh, you, come thank on, you come across very well in, in a public arena. And it's neat to see how people okay. respond to your work. And I don't know if it's your work. They respond to you. They really like you. And it's got to feel good. Well, that is really kind. And, and I appreciate you you saying that. I'm, I'm, I'm actually much obliged for the compliment. I'm not even complimenting you. I'm just telling you how I see it. <laughs> if I saw it the opposite, I would tell you that too. Nancy, you got to be nicer. You got to smile some. <laughs> be outgoing. No. <laughs> no, so you that know, sort of falls you under the... Very, yeah, you do this thing very well. Oh, thanks. Talking I, I guess that's in the, the, no, the no brag, just fact category. <laughs> uh, I mean, honestly, what you're doing is being... You're engaged with your own um, content. You know what I mean? You're not writing romance because that's the moneymaker. You're you're writing the Nancy Quinn story because you're totally down for the experiences that you're having on this earth, which is really cool. Well, I, I, I am. And there's, I just feel, you know, I write the books. And in fact, even the art that I do, ev everything that I do is meant to be uplifting. And even some type of education, whether it's about animals or birds or wildlife, or even just have a laugh at me and don't do what I did, you know, so you can, <sighs> you can learn from my mistakes. That's fine. Um, but it's, it's just meant to, to be engaging and, and a nice 
a nice light because things are, I don't know, things are so serious and dark and right now. And, and there's just, there's so much more to be looking at and thinking about and getting out and seeing the world, you know, step away from the computer for a minute and just take a look around. And I really want to share, share all of that. And if I can bring you out of your life for a little while, if I can make you smile, if I can inspire you to follow a dream, it doesn't have to be my dream, it can be yours. Um, you know, if I can show you that every time you get knocked down, you can get back up. I mean, success in life, it, it's basically a series of failures without losing enthusiasm to keep going and keep moving forward. And that's kind of the message that I want to get out there and also help build a connection to to a, to wildlife and to a, a natural world that you may not have. Like you live in New York, right? So you're not going to see these animals come up into your yard. But isn't it fun? To well, I see deer all the time. I hate deer. Oh, my God. I hate deer so much. I can't grow basil because of deer. You know what I mean? I, I plant anything. They come in and plant. I hate, I, I hate deer so much. I, and I they have just stand there and they house. stare at me. They're like, I'm just going to stand here. And my dog is barking at them. Like, dude, you, I hate deer so much. You need to be shot. Where's my, I need to buy a gun right now and eat venison the rest of this winter time. <laughs> <laughs> and I hear they smell bad and they're covered in like greasy deer germs. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, they, they can, they can be that way, especially if they live more in the city. Um, you're right. It is amazing though, because we do live in the same world, though thousands of miles apart. We mm -hmm. have our coyotes here. We have our bear here. We have deer here as well. I mean, but just they end up getting run over by cars all the time. Oh, that's, yeah. <laughs> I, I see you laughing. Oh, that's wicked. Wicked laugh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're nearing the end. This is a really great conversation. Again, I really enjoyed talking with you. Um, did you want to mention anything that's coming up that you, well, I mean, first off, what are you reading? What are you, you and your husband reading right now? Oh, I think I mentioned last time uh, we were just getting started with with the wolf, um, which is the um, that World War One story about the about the ship, uh -huh. and so we're we're just we're just kind of getting into that one. So I don't really have an opinion about it or a whole lot to say. But so far, what we've started is is really excellent, and I'm enjoying the book. And it'll probably take us a while to get through this one because it's a it's a rather large volume. Um, on my own, I'm actually finishing a book called creating the inspired house. And my hobby is real estate and architecture and design. I, I, I love to, to uh, design and build things. In fact, I have software that lets me design and build homes because that's what I've done most of my life. Since we've moved here, I've always built a home and designed it and lived in it, and moved and done it again. So I'm finding this one a really interesting book that I'm enjoying. You design the home that you live in now? Yes. Yeah, my and husband and I. Yeah, we, it was we built usually. For you guys. Oh, it, well, a lot of it was, but we work right alongside with them. My husband did all the stone work and built the fireplaces. Um, in my art studio, we did all the interior framing with the help of a friend. And we do hire out things like plumbing and and electrical because we're not licensed to do that kind of work. Yeah. But but all of the interior trim work and and the the wood walls and you know that kind of thing. We kitchen cabinets, you know, setting all of that. I I did all this this beautiful stained glass glaze work for my kitchen cabinet. So we're we're kind of handy and we like that hands-on involvement of a, a custom situation. So we just roll up our sleeves and and dive right in. And I've been designing again, and my husband is like, no, no, <laughs> That's you can't hilarious. be thinking that way. <laughs> <laughs> this might come off as an odd statement to make, but I was thinking about, you know, future son-in-laws of yours meeting your husband for the first time. I bet that's going to be an extremely intimidating thing. Here's the Air Force retiree <laughs> who can build his own home, yeah. who, you know, shovels his own driveway every single winter. And yeah. feeds his family with his rifle. Now he doesn't hunt, but still, it'd be quite intimidating. I mean, he sounds like a, a really hardcore dude. He's a great guy, and I always laugh, you know, about we have a 
the girls, even though they're very young, my oldest found this t-shirt that was something about dads against dating. Uh -huh. And and I started laughing and I said, yeah, I said, any future boyfriends, you tell them that we have land in a backhoe, so they better better treat you right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and guns, I would imagine. Yeah, it'd be, oh, oh, so intimidating. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just... <laughs> And plus, you're raising them right, too. So it'll be probably a really great dude that comes home with them one day, I think. I would anyway. hope so. I, I want yeah. them to be happy and, and have a happy life and find someone that they can share their life with, no matter how they decide to live. I mean, if my daughter decides to go to move in New York City and finds a job there and it's what she wants and she's happy, I'm all for it. I, I really well, want them to find their own way. She wants to be a banker or a lawyer or a doctor. She could probably live here no problem anything else <laughs> find another place to live <laughs> detroit i hear detroit's a really nice place for people that aren't lawyers doctors and bankers well <laughs> it's 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 still suffering in a lot of ways but i have to tell you they're making a comeback that's what i hear and it's not mm -hmm. that i had a friend that went down there for a writing conference and he said it wasn't that bad he liked it he's in a yeah. suburb but I mean, there's still a lot of urban blight there. They, the people who live in Detroit did not do well by their own town, which is unfortunate. It I mean, is. the damage there was caused by Detroit or it Michigan, was. for that matter. It was. It was a really. It was a series of very bad choices, and yeah. And now they're having to go through the rebuilding process. Of, so we'll. That's why I appreciate history, right? I mean, you see that, and you're like, okay, well, now we know. We have a roadmap of what not to do. Agreed. <laughs> Poison, Agreed. And water, I, I and wish I wish that more people would would see that very basic reality. I agree with yeah. you. I don't know what's going to happen in this city. I mean, we're getting rid of all the poor people too. They're trying to gentrify the South Bronx now because it's so close hmm. to the city. They're trying to, you know, spread out the rich people like a whole. I don't know where the poor people go that have lived here for generations. I mean, they get shoved someplace and they're not very happy about it and they have no roots. It's not good for America. Uh I don't know. What do you what do you mean by that? Because I'm not sure I understand. You're saying the, the no South Bronx is very the South Bronx is very Puerto Rican and African American. I mean, it's very poor. You know, that's where the poor people are. That's where the gangs are. That's where a lot of violence is. Um, but it's a, a very short bridge ride from Manhattan. So now it's turning out to be coveted real estate. They've got all these former factories and loft spaces, and people want to live there, and they can sell these places for millions and millions of dollars if they weren't inhabited inhabited by you know poor people <laughs> so they make things very very difficult for people who are living there to continue living there they stop investing in the infrastructure they um you know the landlords stop fixing houses and apartments and you know people get evicted very easily and you well know, doesn't crime. that make the their own real estate values go down i don't they can still sell to the rich people when the poor people move out i mean it's it's hard look at harlem which happened there or like in Queens, the Long Island uh, city area, which was basically empty. It was a horrible place to live. And now it's just got a bunch of gigantic buildings. You know, mm. I mean, we're not even dealing with American money. We're dealing with foreign investors who have like bottomless pockets. Huh. So, well, I, I, you know, I wasn't aware of that. So I, I don't, I, I don't really have a, I don't really have a comeback for you. I don't really have a reply there. I, I well, would look have at to Detroit to... too. I mean, it was basically emptied out of everybody, and now it's just a bunch of buildings. So I mean, huh. you could do, it's a blank canvas. I mean, go in there and do anything you want with it, and that's what they're hoping to do with the Bronx as well. I see. So I see what you mean now. Okay. You get, a, well, you get rid of things, and you can build on top of it. It's it's not good, but it's not. Yeah, it's horrible. It's really really devastating to think about, because you're getting rid of like a whole culture of people that make the city vibrant and alive and colorful. There's a place called uh, Sylvia's in Harlem. And there's like the soul food place. You'd go there and get, you know, black eyed peas and fried chicken. And it's like really good food. It's historically famous. But now because the tourists know about it, it's just complete crap. It's really boring and bland. You know, they open cans. They don't have to impress anybody because the people that were in that neighborhood originally who love Sylvia's, who propped that place up for decades and made it, you know, world famous, they don't mm -hmm. live there anymore. So there's nobody to impress. And the tourists hear about Sylvia's and they show up and they'll eat anything. <laughs> you really? throw it on a menu. Huh. Yeah. They, you call it famous and they'll show up. Well, isn't that something? Hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know. New York, I think we were talking about your daughter moving here. I think she's better off <laughs> living yeah, someplace I, else. I honestly don't see her doing that. I was just kind of using it as a as an idea that whatever her dreams happen to be, I will try to support her and, and help her. I don't expect her to live and make the same kinds of choices that I did. That's that's not, I didn't raise her to, you know, to be a mini me. I raised her to be an individual and make her own choices and find her own happiness. And it takes a, it takes a tough person to wake up and go outside in sub freezing temperatures and feed horses. No matter how much love you have for those animals, it just really does make a tough person out of you. It does. It does make you grow up and it does make you be responsible and it does make you look at things outside of yourself. And I think that that's something really important that a lot of people need to look at more is the idea of, you know, everyone's always looking at it from, you know, how does this affect me and how do I feel about it? Well, sometimes there's other things that are more important and you have to sort of get away or get off of your own emotions and and focus on the job at hand when you're responsible for other other people or other living things. And I think it's an excellent it's an excellent lesson. And we haven't been having yeah. tremendously cold temperatures. I mean No, it's cold, a weird climate and, nowadays. Yeah, the coldest temperature I think recorded in Montana was was back in January of nineteen fifty four and it was seventy below. And that's Ooh. not with a window. That's <sighs> That's the What's the coldest it's been so far this year? Oh, now we've we haven't had much of anything. I think we've had maybe six or eight below for a day or Zero. two. And you know, today I told you it's it's forty degrees and raining. It's very strange. Yeah, so very we're not facing it's any like of the, the raining, kinds huh? of storms. Yeah, we don't. It, we're not facing that kind really of weather. I mean, you and your husband are successful. You've done what you wanted. You stuck your nose into it. You fought. You succeeded. Mm -hmm. And, you know, your kids are going to watch that and they're going to learn from that. You know, there are a lot of people out there whose parents didn't have the opportunity or weren't able to succeed like that. And those are the kids are pulling themselves out of, you know, neck deep in muck, basically. So, I mean. I well, know you know, I well. was one. Of, I was one of those kids that pulled myself out and um, I didn't grow up with with privilege. I, I honestly don't really like to talk a lot about my childhood. It wasn't very, very great. And, but the way I look at it is that, you know, you can't let your past define you to the point to where it becomes an excuse. And the things that have happened to me, I have always looked at it like, well, okay, this is what I got. This is what happened. Now, how can I get out of it? And how can I make it better? And how can I plan for the future to make sure that I I live better than I do now. And so that has always been my my motivation. In fact, there's a there's a German proverb that I really love and it says we cannot let me think about this. So I want to say it correctly. We cannot direct the wind, but we can adjust the sails. Ha <laughs> ha, I love it. Yeah, that sounds like it's right. I've heard that before. Yeah, and, and I've always believed that. I can't really control a lot of what happens to me, but I can control what I'm going to do about it, what my perspective and perception is going to be about it. Um, I've, I've never really gone into the victim philosophy. I've always thought that, yeah, things happen to you and sometimes they're terrible, but that's what happened. So what are you going to do to fix it? And I've that way. Yeah. And I've helped girls with that same idea. You're breaking so up on me a little bit. That's, I mean, that's, that's kind of the philosophy, kind of the philosophy in a nutshell. I, I enjoy that as an idea. Um, you know, you can make your life better if you try harder, if you work harder, if you don't let your setbacks or your failures get to you, because that can happen. And so why does this matter? Because I keep failing. Now, you know, we said something earlier that I wanted to comment on too about, you know, not being too aware of what's happening in the outside world and kind of what your 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 area, your place now kind of wash over you with kind of what did you say? You know, relax into where you are instead of letting the world outside kind of haunt you. But I mean it's it's difficult to not let it. You know, mm -hmm. Afghanistan 40 years ago was a really great place. <laughs> and then the Russians invaded and that's hell on earth. And it's really interesting how fast stuff like that can happen. And so going to, 
you know, history and life, everything is going to continue to to evolve and change, and it won't it won't be static. And if I left you with the impression that move up to a mountain and ignore the world around you, I'm I'm that I'm sorry. That's that might have been my mistake because that is certainly not how we feel. And I'm still, you know, we're still quite involved with with what goes on in in the world and um, even with uh, you know po politics and and things that will affect us and we're we're quite involved in that. However, the nice thing is is that living up here it does allow us to to kind of step away from it. Um, but we're not certainly not isolated to the fact that well you know we've got our own little place here and everything else in the world doesn't matter to me. Um, no. That is, and I don't want that for my girls either. And what, well, I was about to say it would be nice if you did have a bunker that you could shut off the world and have to worry about the the repercussions of other people's actions. Well, you can um, temporarily. You you temporarily can. is the point, yeah. isn't it? Eventually, you have to come up for air, and then you're yeah. gonna have to deal with whatever nightmare exists above you or below you or whatever. Exactly, and and you need that time on your basic daily life. You need to be able to pull away from from that, but we can't exist in a vacuum and mm -hmm. the world goes on around you and you're either going to contribute to it or you're not going to be making a, a difference in the world. You know, bad things happen because good people sit by and do nothing. So you can withdraw from the world for a while, but you also have to have something to contribute to it in, in whatever way that is. And, you know, I think, I think you are contributing a good thing to the world. And I'm really happy that, again, you've been able to, you know, spare me an hour and 21 minutes of your life to kind of open up those doors and, and let me see what's going on inside of them and, you know, let all my listeners see as well. Um, well, I'm always glad to talk to you, Brian. Yeah. I think we have the most interesting conversations and other people tell me that they really enjoy them too. So, yeah, it's it's time well spent. And I really appreciate you you asking me to, you know, to talk again. It's it's wonderful for me, so thank you. Yeah, no problem. We'll get you back on and see how the spring is treating you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> like. that will be that will be a little nicer. We'll probably have have a lot of nice things to talk about then, Hopefully. for sure. Um, so in the meantime, now, where can people find you? What do you want people to know? Where can they buy your art? All that good stuff. Well, the website, which is quinnwildlifeart.com is basically the gateway to everything that you need because I have linked there my YouTube channel, which I really hope that people will investigate. It's, as everyone will tell you, I'm, I'm very brand new to YouTube. I probably have about 20 videos up now. And, and so it is hard to kind of get a foothold and get started there. But what I have, it, it, I have some really beautiful things to offer. And it's not always just about myself but again about the animals and the mountains and I have some gorgeous videos about the Montana sunsets which are just breathtaking there's a lot of funny things on there too if you need a little pick me up for a sense of humor I even have a blooper reel and uh, so there so there's lots to see there and I'm hoping that people will investigate that so I have a YouTube channel I also the, have a Twitter the only thing account. I would say about your YouTube channel is don't get um you know just keep doing it you know, oh, I will. Investing mm -hmm. in that because you know it's not going to be millions of people necessarily, and until it is millions of people, you never know. But I mean, I don't know. I enjoy this part of it more than I do anything else. Well, i I think I've got I think I've got a good start. Of course, Facebook is changing tremendously right now, but I do have, uh, you know, a group there, and you can join that. There's also just a professional page that you can access and talk to me answer questions and things. Now that I have that high noon tea segment, I'm still encouraging people to go ahead and, and send me a message in through the website or, or through social media and let me know what their questions are because I love answering them. It's really fun for me. Um, and that way they get to, to see something more up close rather than I still reply to them in writing through an email, but it's a whole lot more fun to actually maybe see what they're asking and and get that kind of connection, which, yeah, which is always good. I, it's almost like answering them in person. So, um, so yeah, I'm I'm available out there. Of course, I have book signings and things through Barnes and Noble, and I usually post that and and keep that information going. So if anybody wants to stop it, 
one of the bookstores and, and say hello, that would be amazing too. I've actually met people who have said, oh, I've seen you on either YouTube or somewhere else. And then they've come, come to the signing and, and that's another way that, to interact. So yep, always happy to talk with people. It's a, it's a big part of my job that I just love. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I really enjoyed talking with you today too. Um, and uh, well, I mean, stay warm, as warm as you possibly can. And thankfully it's not 1955. Uh, yes, <laughs> I completely agree with that. I hope, I hope that's one part of history that doesn't repeat itself. Yeah, right. I mean, I don't know what's happening with this climate kind of situation, but I guess we'll all find out together. All right, Nancy, thank you so much, and I'll talk to you again soon. Okay, thanks so much, Brian. Truly enjoyed it.